That depends how you define those goals. Um, if the intention was to uh, invade a foreign country and destroy its government and its society, um, then, then yes, it did. Um, if uh, you take US officials at their word um, and accept that they had the intention of replacing that regime and that society with something better, then no, obviously, they did not. Um, uh, my friend Dar Jamail was in Iraq a few months ago, and he found very few people in Iraq today who would say that uh, their lives are better today than under Saddam Hussein's regime. And uh, that is not in any way to say anything good about Saddam Hussein. It is to say that the United States and its allies destroyed Iraq. Um, the, the invasion was not just some sort of mistake. The invasion and occupation were a serious crime. That was, that was a crime of aggression under the UN Charter, as, as Kofi Annan acknowledged. And um, aggression was defined uh, under the Nuremberg Principles and by the judges at Nuremberg as the supreme international crime. And th the wisdom of renouncing aggression, renouncing war uh, in the UN Charter is borne out by, by what we have seen in all the acts of aggression that the US has committed uh, over the past uh, 10 or 12 years. You know, not, not one of them has in fact managed to bring, managed to reduce terrorism, managed to establish a better form of government, managed to um, ma make anybody safer. And in fact, uh, so when we look at the absolute chaos today in Iraq, Libya, Syria, you know, I, th I think we have to ask who is responsible and, and are, they in, are these, in fact, crimes for which people should be held criminally responsible? Well, except that Iraq was not a hornet's nest before. Um, and again, this once again bears out the, uh, the wisdom of the UN Charter. Uh, l let me read you a, a very short quote from Norwegian General Robert Mood, who oversaw the peacekeeping force that went into Syria in 2012 to oversee the failed ceasefire. And he said, it is fairly easy to use the military tool because when you launch the military tool in classical interventions, something will happen and there will be results. The problem is that the results are almost all the time different than the political results you were aiming for when you decided to launch it. So the other position, arguing that it is not the role of the international community, neither coalitions of the willing nor the UN Security Council, for that matter, to change governments inside a country, is also a position that should be respected. So I think if there's a lesson for all of us, for the whole world, to learn from this experience, it is exactly what he just said. Um, we need a framework of international law that is respected by all, including the most powerful countries like the United States. The use of military force cannot achieve the, any constructive goals, as, a, as our leaders claim. Um, you know, since the Second World War, every U.S. military in, intervention everywhere has been a complete disaster, whether you're talking about Korea, Vietnam, um, Central America in the 1980s, um, or the, this entire history of the past 12 years. And, you know, really after Vietnam, I think most Americans understood this. Uh, Richard Barnett, who founded the Institute of Policy Studies in Washington, he wrote a book called Roots of War in 1972, and he said in that book, he said that um, 
the, the, the irony is that we, we are at a point where the, the, the number one country has perfected the science of killing. But at the very moment that this has happened, it is no longer a practical means of political domination. And as I say, I, th I think, you know, this, this, is, this is the irony of the place of our country, the United States, in world history. That at the point where we have these, these weapons that are powerful enough to destroy the entire world, we can no longer use them to any practical, constructive purpose. And yet, we have virtually bankrupted this country. Since Richard Barnett wrote those words in 1972, the U.S. has spent 17, at least 17 trillion dollars on its military, which is, happens to be exactly equal to our supposedly unsustainable national debt. Uh, and so this is really just a, a tragic, tragic history. And, but, you know, all, what we should do now is to try and learn from that and uh, recommit to the rule of international law. We just saw how effective that can be in Syria by actually um, working, actually practicing diplomacy within the rule of international law, bringing in the uh, chemical weapons regime to uh, the, the international UN uh, chemical weapons regime to dismantle the chemical weapons. And, how, you know, how much better that works than, than uh, launching missile strikes. Because Iraq is still suffering from uh, the destruction of its regime and its government and its society by the United States. Um, the United States employed a classic divide and rule strategy, pitting people of different sects against each other and in, in, inciting violence that, that is completely unprecedented in that country. And, um, and now has uh, uh, has, has installed a, sect, a sectarian-based government that, that only represents the people of one sect. Um, it is still receiving huge amounts of so-called security uh, assistance from the United States to the United States built uh, powerful organs of state terrorism in Iraq it said the CIA sent uh, a retired colonel by the name of James Steele to Iraq in 2004. He recru eventually recruited 27 brig brigades of special police commandos who then waged a reign of terror that killed tens of thousands of mostly Sunni men and boys in Baghdad and around the country. Um, they have since been rebranded first as the National Police when one of their torture centers was discovered um, back during that period, and then now as the Federal Police. Um, they are still effectively run by Adnan al-Assadi, who has been the Deputy Interior Minister there since 2005. So that regime of... Um, of, of of repress, state repression and terror that, that the United States installed in Iraq it is still functioning and, and still um, conducting extrajudicial executions in addition to one of the largest numbers of uh, supposedly legal executions in the world. Um, you know, in, in Iraq, you can, you can be sentenced to death uh, for property crimes, you can be sentenced to death under accusations of terrorism that in, you know, in trials that, that, that only last, uh, you know, at best an hour or two and, uh, you know, with very little legal representation. The, you know, human rights officials from the UN have, have absolutely condemned the justice system that the U.S. established in, so-called justice system that the U.S. established in Iraq, and, and has, 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 de has demanded, the U.N. Human Rights Council has demanded that Iraq immediately cease these hangings.
Sometimes they, they, they hang 40, more than 40 people in one day, including women as well. And uh, this, is, this is just a reign of terror. And in that sense, some of the worst aspects of the U.S. occupation uh, are still continuing today. You know, the, there has always been um, resistance in Iraq to this, this, the, 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 this, this reign of terror and to this, this, this highly illegitimate government. Um, and most of, that, most of that is political, nonviolent uh, resistance. Um, and so since 2011, when the Arab Spring began, you know, there were massive demonstrations all over Iraq in 2011 during the Arab Spring. They were, they were not reported very much in the West uh, for, you know, political reasons. Um, and so, you know, there, there is a great, great demand from the people of Iraq uh, to, you know, to, to, to change this situation. And, um, but as long as the U.S. continues support, to support um, this, this highly repressive government, you know, it is very difficult and it is continuing to cost the, the sacrifice of, of, of thousands of lives. Um, it is obviously ex exploited by ex extremist, Islamist, uh, Sunni groups, uh, supported by the, the Saudis and others on, on the other side. So you've got a, an extremist uh, Shiite government and you've got extremist, uh, you know, Sunni right-wing fundamentalist terrorism and you've got millions of innocent civilians caught up in the middle. But their capacity for resistance was, was systematically broken down by the U.S. occupation. Hundreds and hundreds of academics were killed. Uh, thousands of, of professionals uh, fled the country during the U.S. occupation. You know, almost anyone who, who, who could get out, you know, fled for their lives under, under threat of death. By, by different um, militias and factions uh, in, in Iraq. So, um, you know, it will take an awful lot for Iraq to recover from this. But, you know, for, for American viewers watching this, I, I think it's important to understand, you know, our responsibility and our government's responsibility for this. You know, the. President Nixon promised $3.3 billion in reparations to Vietnam. Not a penny of that was ever paid. We should be paying reparations to help the people of Iraq recover from what was done in our name to them. We should be pressing, pressing for um, our leaders to be held accountable for these crimes. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, I went with a group of people here in Miami to the Canadian consulate and met with the political officer there because uh, Mr. Richard Cheney, the former vice president of uh, the United States, was scheduled to speak at an economic forum in Toronto. So, so we, along with human rights groups and lawyers in Canada and in the United States, were asking Canada to please do what we have failed to do to, to uh, I, I, to honor its obligations under the Convention Against Torture to either bar Mr. Cheney from entering Canada or if he was allowed into Canada to please arrest him and investigate his alleged crimes. Um, unfortunately, the, the government of Canada, um, now with a very conservative government, uh, failed once again, to uh, uphold its, its obligations under the Convention Against Torture. Um, the, the, the U.S. occupation as, of Iraq, as well as being an act of aggression, when you consider that probably about 10% of the Sunni population were killed, and pro pro probably 25% of them were, were driven from their homes, um, clearly, meets the definition of genocide as, as it is defined in the 
Genocide Convention. And so, and, and the, the occupation included systematic daily violations of the Convention Against Torture and, and many, many articles of the Geneva Conventions. And so the U.S. officials responsible for all of that really have, have, have many, many uh, charges to answer. And, and, and we should understand as Americans that uh, while you know, there have been indictments in Spain um, and, uh, and Mr. Bush was prevented from traveling to Switzerland, uh, Mr. Rumsfeld was almost prevented from traveling to Belgium at one point. Um, the, the primary responsibility under all the international treaties that, that the United States has signed is on us. It is our responsibility to hold senior, major American war criminals responsible for their crimes. And, and, and that continues. Um, the, you know, the, uh, the Obama administration has not just failed to hold the officials of the previous administration accountable, but it has continued many of these crimes. You know, a, a aggression is aggression, whether, you know, it's, it's a full-scale invasion or, or simply flying drones in, over another country and uh, uh, blowing up people's homes. Um, so, you know, the crimes, the, the U.S. crimes continue. After the U.S. was convicted by the International Court of Justice in the 1980s, of committing aggression against Nicaragua, the U.S. declared it would simply no longer recognize the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. It has never recognized the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, you know, which so far is functioning as a sort of international African court because the only, the only people that have been charged have been from Africa. And of course, this is completely undermining the, the legitimacy of the court. You know, the very, little by little, no one in Africa is going to cooperate with it if they, they see it simply targeting their own leaders while uh, the leaders of the United States and other countries just completely uh, get off the hook. So we have a responsibility for collective responsibility, a collective responsibility which we can fulfill by the payment of war reparations, and we have criminal accountability by which we need to charge civilian and military officials who were responsible for the, the, the horrors inflicted on the people of Iraq um, with, you know, under our own laws, under the United States War Crimes Act, um, for the crimes they committed. You know, some of your viewers may be surprised to hear some of the things I'm saying because the, the U.S. media has simply never, never addressed uh, this, this incredible human tragedy in Iraq in these kind of terms. Um, and in fact, um, well, I, as I say, I, you know, I, and I think any reporter who, who talks to people in Iraq today can ascertain pretty quickly that, um, you know, there, there are very few people, only perhaps, you know, those affiliated with um, the, uh, the government that was installed by the occupation, perhaps some of those people would, uh, would feel that they are now better off. But, but for ordinary Iraqis, very, very few would say that they are better off today, and yet, and yet that, would pro that would actually come incredibly this would come as a surprise to many Americans. Many Americans, you know, because the media has, has reported in such a biased fashion on this, this entire catastrophe, um, you know, many Americans simply do not, are unaware. I mean, you, you, you mentioned in your invitation to me the Iraq body count, you know, which, which has some estimate of, you know, 100 or 200,000 Iraqis killed. Um, but, but that is based on passive reporting. You know, actual epidemiological studies in Iraq have found anywhere from 400,000 to over a million Iraqis killed. And um, Le Les Roberts, who, who pioneered 
uh, epidemi epidemiology in war zones in Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo. He took part in, in one of those epidemiological log studies in Iraq. And, you know, he, he found exactly the same pattern in Iraq that he had found in Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo, that passive reporting of, of deaths in a war zone uh, generally only capture between 5 and 20 percent of the actual deaths that emerge from more in-depth studies. So I Iraq body count is a passive, it, it's based on passive reporting. They're taking numbers from the Iraqi health ministry, numbers reported in the Western media, and, and sort of adding those up. But um, I, I, again, I, and, and Le Les Roberts found it exactly the same thing in Iraq that he found in Rwanda and uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, that probably, um, you know, five to 20 times as many people as that were actually killed in Iraq. And so, yes, thousands of people are still being killed. It's, and, and the exact numbers are probably very hard to know. Um, it is less than during most of the U.S. occupation. Um, most of the people killed during the U.S. occupation were killed by U.S. or allied forces or U.S. trained Iraqi forces. Um, when the Iraqi Health Ministry reported in 2004 and 2005 that that was the case, that most of the deaths were not uh, from resistance forces or insurgents, but from the occupying forces, um, you know, that was reported uh, in, even in the Miami Herald, actually, by um, McClatchy, um, by Nancy Youssef, uh, who was, did some very good reporting. The BBC, but once the BBC got a hold of it and started reporting that, uh, John Simpson reported that on, uh, in preparing for a panorama show in Britain uh, for the BBC. But by the t before the actual panorama show uh, aired, he was contacted by the Iraqi Minister of Health saying, no, 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 that's not what the numbers show. <laughs> Even though these were their own figures, you know. And yet uh, he, he said, no, no, we really don't have no idea who killed all these people. Um, and so, um, you know, I mean, you can see the original, you know, you can find on, you know, thankfully on the World Wide Web, you can find uh, a websites like Information Clearinghouse, you can find the original BBC report, and then you can find its retraction and its sort of, uh, you know, re-edited report, almost sort of apologizing for having reported what the Iraqi, you know, the occupation health ministry had told them. Um, so, you know, I mean, r really, I, I think when we look at Libya, when we look at Syria, we, we, need, we need, really need to understand, and I think, I think most Americans, I, I, think, I think Americans deserve more credit than they usually get for grasping these issues. And, this, and I think that kind of explains why we saw this massive, massive outcry against the prospect of new U.S. aggression against Syria. Well, and if people want to know more about the U.S. invasion and destruction of Iraq, you know, please get a hold of a copy of my book. It's called Blood on Our Hands, the U.S., the American Invasion and Destruction of Iraq. Um, and, uh, you know, people can read my other work on Syria and on U.S. militarism and U.S. war crimes uh, at Alternet or in Z Magazine. Thank you.